terrorist and anti organization are more likely to hide, fight fight all these wars in a more long time because they have a lot more number of the tools to keep fighting on, and that is the reason why they can keep going on to the fighting, and that is the reason why at the first war that is going to be exacerbated, as that is going to prolong because it empowers a military group, so forth. Now sit down. I'm over, Mr. Speaker, that is the problem we are going to see for this point. But certainly, what we have to say so, is that it is very likely that terrorist and anti-government groups are more likely to cause a conflict. Why? Because those people have to make a calculation whether they can actually make a certain harm to society, whether they can actually craft out the government. If those people can more actually purchase all these tools that is necessary for the, necessary for the conflict, it is more likely that those people are going to deal with the warfare because they can actually now get up get those weapons cheaper, and even at the same price, get a weapon that is by more high quality, right? Then this is the vicious cycle comes in, right, Mr. Speaker? When once the terrorist group power is going to be enhanced, that is when the like, government has to seek for more military aid to actually nurture the power of the military, government's military, and then the better weapon is again going to spread out inside the terrorist group, and they're the ones who are going to get empowered. This is going to be a vicious cycle, empowering both of the groups, and make a conflict more likely to happen, because terrorists more likely to deal with the conflict, and make the war horrible in these cases. That is the reason why I think this is much of a problem. Yes, sir. The militants and insurgents have already acquired the military or weaponry within the existing black market. In order to crack down these people, the military needs stronger weaponry. How do you deal with the existing conflict as a your model? Yeah. I agree on this point. But first thing, Mr. Speaker, what we have to realize is what the problem is. This model is the same that is actually accessible situations, right? We agree that those people can actually buy these weapons for the black market, but the point is actually just all this military aid that is going to the one stick to the government is something making a situation horrible, makes the weapon cheaper, and we think that situation is exacerbated. What is the harm about this, Mr. Speaker? What we have realized is the warfare is actually the enemy of the development. It actually destroys the facilities, it destroys the faculties, it actually kills the people, and if the war is going to prolong, yeah. then which means there will be more expanded number of people who are going to be killed, more facilities are going to be destroyed, and that is when those actually development is going to be destroyed by this. This is the situation we are going to see why actually this special cycle happens by giving a military aid over development aid. So, how the giving a development aid is going to be beneficial, Mr. Speaker? Firstly, we believe that there is going to be a better development inside the country. The reason is one, because we think the scale of the war is going to be small, because there will be firstly a number, a small number of the weapons that is necessary for the war to come going on. And it, is, it is more likely for the terrorist group to actually forfeit or to give up the war when they are in a lack of the military scales, like for example the weapon and so forth. If they do not have weapons, they are more likely to actually forfeit and stop the war itself. And we think there will be also a less amount of the war that is going to happen within the country because there will be it's going to be more difficult for the people to actually acquire all these technologies weapons and so forth, and that's the reason why we think in, this is going to be better. Which means we are going to give a more better, safe environment for the development to keep going on. Facilities are going to prevent harm in we're going to be responsible. Moreover, if we actually give them more money to the profit aid, which means those people can actually create, a, for example, like a protection method to actually protect all these facilities, which actually require more money to actually protect the facilities, or can actually diversify the personal facility so that even if the one facility is going to be cracked down, other facilities can be going on and sustain a sustained development. So, Mr. Speaker, first thing we have to realize is somehow military aid was something actually to harm the society, even though that seems to happen. We think giving the profit aid more is beneficial to us. I like Prime Minister for speech. Now I invite the leader of opposition. not win over the now fragile democracy. Yeah. They gave us no analysis at all about why development aid is good. All they told us is that guns might go out there or something. What we're going to tell them are three things. The uniqueness of the Sahel, why development aid doesn't work. Second, why if we give development aid, it will only empower militants. And third, the necessity of military power in these regions to safeguard democracy. But first, a bit of rebuttal. The entire point was only focused on the provision of guns. First of all, Islamic militants already have guns, right? They're not out 
out in the desert being like, well, no guns. I guess we can't fight, right? They're performing attacks on an almost daily basis on the capitals of these cities. Tripoli is hit by terrorist attacks uh, on, a, on, a, on at least a weekly basis and sometimes a daily basis. But what we say is military aid is like not just guns, right? In fact, it's probably things like anything besides guns, most of the time because people already have guns, right? It's things like radar, GPS tracking, better training for your troops so they know how to fight against militants and they know how to win battles. Or things like enough money to actually pay for your military to exist in the first place. Because if you can't afford to pay your military, there's no way for you to ensure your sovereignty and ensure that you can beat these militants, right? So the analysis about just like guns being there doesn't really hold since the guns are already there and the most important parts of military aid are not giving guns. It's things like training, things like funding to support the military in the first place. But furthermore, they're trying to tell us that the presence of military aid makes the war go on. Say, no, Islamic extremists say they will fight until the entire world follows Sharia law and recognizes the return of the caliphate. Okay? These people are not fighting based on rational means. Rather, they're fundamentalists who want to overthrow the democracies. They hate these democracies. They see them as Western puppets, right? So the way to stop the war is to defeat these militants because they are not going away and they are here for the long term until their vision of the world is achieved. Now, going to voice of force. First, the uniqueness of the Sahel and why development aid doesn't work. The Sahel is a mostly nomadic desert region, right? There's very little settlements, there's very little farming. These people follow very traditional ways of life. As such, development aid is relatively ineffective in improving their quality of life. Why is that? Well, first of all, they don't farm. They don't have settlements. So like traditional methods of giving development aid, things like uh, giving farm subsidies, or giving like better fertilizer or better seeds, or things like building infrastructure, is just irrelevant to the people of this hell because they don't live in traditional settlements. So giving development aid to these people like doesn't work in the traditional sense. Rather, the development aid that is given is mostly things like food packages or clothing. But the thing is that governments have no supervision over these regions. That means that these sorts of commodities are just taken advantage of by the existing power structures, by the warlords and the chieftains. And they either use them as bribes or gifts to ensure their own power, or they sell them on the black market in order to raise funds. That's why in Tripoli, if you go to a market, you see lots of American goods on sale. Because the development, the, 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 the development goods given to these nomadic regions are just sold on the black market in the capital in order to raise funds, because warlords are in control of the local networks, right? But furthermore, and more perniciously, is that militants have infiltrated these traditional societies, right? These societies are very susceptible to infiltration by Islamic militants because they're a warrior culture. They're extremely traditional and extremely religious. So they identify very strongly with the message of militants, which is based on warfare, which is based on religious extremism, right? So they identify very strongly with these militants, and these militants, because they have better know-how, because they have funding, and they are linked to like militant cells around the world, are able to take advantage of these existing nomadic cultures. That means when we give these cultures these sorts of development aid, the money actually goes to funding the very militants that we are trying to suppress and we are trying to defeat, right? So it's completely counterproductive to give development aid to these regions because we're in fact just funding the very people that we want to defeat. Right. Um, so in this context, why do we need military aid over development aid? So in the context of very fragile democracies, democracies where lots of change has happened recently and where existing structures have been relatively disempowered because of the gravity of the change, the biggest threats due to stability are the attacks from these militants. Right? The attacks cannot be or like cannot be effectively stopped under the status quo because they don't have sufficient resources to combat these militants having gone through this radical change. That means that in order for these countries, from Algeria and Tunisia, for example, to crack down on the militants in the Sahel region, hiding out, they need an effective military in order to fight back. And if they don't have an effective military, the legitimacy of these governments comes under like uh, like it's massively undermined because they can't protect their own people from their enemies, right? In this context, where these countries could be overthrown by Islamic fundamentalist militants, we run the risk of seeing failed states, right, when they're in this fragility. This is what happened in Somalia, when al-Shabaab when al was not able to be suppressed by the government, right? The, the entire country fell into chaos because of this, the strength of this military. Likewise, in the Congo, because governments could not suppress the militants, the entire country collapsed, and the quality of life of the people in that country was massively undermined. So giving development isn't going to isn't the way that we need to help these people. Rather, what we need to do is to ensure the stability of their states, 
to mention the states do not fall into a state of like, of like a failed state status like Somalia or like the Congo, and to ensure that these fragile democracies are able to continue until existing structures are strong enough to effectively combat these militants and to assure stability. I'll take it to you why. Okay. Okay, we recognize the importance to secure the, the, those kind of countries position, but problem coming from your side is why the country's own military is absolutely necessary. It's absolutely necessary because there are Islamic militants with weapons trying to kill the people in that country yeah, and overthrow yeah. the government because they're fundamentalists who want to impose Sharia law. That's why we need a military. When you have like like massively organized militant structures linked to terrorist networks funded by like international monetary reserves, like you need an effective military to fight them. Um, so. What have we shown you today? We've shown you very clearly that development aid doesn't work in the context of these particular societies. That the development aid that is given is merely used to fund existing power structures, but more perniciously to fund the militants who have taken advantage of these extreme, conservative, traditional societies um, as their hiding place, right? Because they're out of traditional government control. Furthermore, we've shown that in order to ensure the stability of new democracies, we need to effectively crack down on the militants who are trying to overthrow and take advantage of this weakness. Um, what happened in Somalia, what happened in Congo, can never be repeated. The human cost, the human toll of having your country fall into chaos cannot be compared to any other harm. And for that sake, for the sake of stability and for the sake of democracy, we are very proud to stand on the side of our Fantastic of a speech now during Port Upon, Deputy Prime Minister. and that region becomes bloodstained. And what we believe in this debate from the opening government is that it is time for African nations to shift its stance in order to achieve, non uh, in order to achieve more sustainable people's lives. It is, uh, and it is necessary to limit capacity of military spending and it is necessary to enlarge capacity of private corporation spending in order to pay for their workers, in order to prevent bankruptcy. Because that, because they, that is the only way for this, this society to create soft power, not just hard power to attack against military, it's, uh, attack against fundamentals itself, but it, it just enlarges people's capacity to weigh their life, not, not, not recruited by those militants in, in the first place, and that is extremely necessary things. And that is the reason why we are saying that now it's time for them to change the stance. So what is the standard on which we prioritize certain types of aid over others? There are two. Firstly, less humanitarian harm occurring, occurring, uh, coming from that aid. And secondly, more sustainability of people and society's lives in the first place. So, uh, all rebuttals are in, in the ways. Firstly, I'm going to talk about why in terms of extent of humanitarian harm enabled by each type of aid, why military aid is in much worse and the development aid is at least better. So, in the fir fir firstly, about the military aid, we heard from the leader of opposition, the benefit of military aid Aid, it has, it, it's a counterpart to more underground flow of weapons or more underground flow of like those fundamentals <coughs> for going to attack those capital cities. We think 
uh, we don't know if the weather has power is always beneficial to tackle these underground threats, right? Because the reason why people are, for example, recruit, uh, recruited by militants, for example, is because they don't have self-sustaining way to keep living Stop. there, to keep, in, keep industry there, to keep their daily life there, because there is no de de development, but it's expansion of industries, that is expansion of people, uh, more people's capacity to live by themselves. That is the reason why in many countries, in many societies out there in Sahara, in Sahara regions, most of the, the reason why militants like get power is because they are able to recruit people much and, much and more and more, right? We think if people Stop. are not suffering from that, uh, not suffering from that poverty or those reasons that they are suffering because they are unemployed, we don't, we think the people if the people don't have have to suffer from that situation, people don't have to be recruited to there. And that is the reason why under our pattern, if development goes on, we think people don't people don't have to be recruited in there. And that is the reason why by by utilizing this soft power, we can reduce people's incentive to enlarge the fundamentals having military force and having um, force to attack capital cities. That is extremely necessary. So we heard from them. Militants are writing from Arab Spring or from big, we say, are hiding in Saharan area. The thing is, it is not necessary to reinforce military or state to tackle them, as I, as I said. And also, they told about the hatred against democracy that is held by these people. The question here is that if democracy is equipped with West supported military force, why do you think it's, like, don't you think it's enlarging their hostility even more? Because age enables to like, make perception to the, these people that somehow state's power of violence against them is connected to like West that they don't like and they are going to crack down Muslims with the power of violence that is supported by democratic power and supported by Western power. We think this situation is, is enlarging their hostility even more under their case because military itself, the power of violence itself is a, it's a symbol of attack against Muslims by the Western society. We think that is extremely necessary analysis about what what is the image of military? What is the image of the power of violence? So, no thank you. They said state doesn't have capacity to control everything. If that is true, that means that their, their like, proposal itself, the proposal for uh, military aid itself doesn't work so much, right? Because they, don't, because they can't find out where to go into in order to crack down those fundamentals. But there is, Mr. Speaker, clear humanitarian harm in military aid because it enables accommodation of people as soldiers even more, accommodation of people as states violent power even more because it makes capacity to hire soldiers right, in the first place, right? It says that people are massively invited into states as public power that is connected with the West in the first place, that I, that I, as I analyzed just now. So we think. No, thank you. So the goodness of development aid on the uh, 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 against that is that it trickles down to private sphere that is not necessarily connected to state violent power, to uh, the West, West power, which is more difficult to be associated with state official power to attack fundamentals equipped by Western force. We think that is necessary because that, that changes the perception of those fundamentals, right? People are not enemy of them, right? The, the, they, even though we cannot, even though it is impossible for us to change those fundamental view about the West itself, we can at least change the view about people because people don't have to be uh, uh, don't have to be hired or uh, 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 so, uh, like invited to Western force they, uh, to to the state force equipped by Western support. Okay. okay. Given that America funded the Arab Spring and supported these regimes and created these regimes, why would America now just giving some aid to the military? I, change the way these fundamentalists view the state? Because in the first place, that is just a matter of the past in the first place, right? We think, we think in order to change the perception from now on, it is necessary to it is necessary to now change the way in which people live, the way in which people live, live and that, that way in which people live in the state, in the like, prioritization of that, like, uh, military aid is much worse because that is leading to leading us to second argument about sustainability of people's lives and society. Military aid. So what logically happens from prioritization of military aid is that people's demand for job in military itself increases because capacity of military is crucially enlarged to accommodate people there and conduct military operations there. So problem here is the balance between development aid and military military aid in the status quo uh, is like prioritization of military aid means that states give more support to military aid sector over over cooperation sector. So given the context where cooperation are not sustainably functioning in, in these societies, this priority of, priority of support causes in people's mind a feeling that it could be more sustainable for me to be 
be recruited by the military of the state. Then, then more people become soldiers. Then according to that demand, more guns and bombs are brought for them. And that is the reason why these people have become unable to go into private sector and corporation sector and to the in order to sustain their lives by themselves. We think this is this situation is crucially re re reducing these people's so far to counter that, to counter the attraction of those military military in the first place. And that's the reason why we propose that. Thank you. Our next speaker for speech now I will like to call upon Deputy Leader of Opposition. humanitarian crisis which is better, still in terms of sustainability which is better. My uh, final argument is about how the community uh, sorry, the development aid is internationally you know, funding the terrorist organization because these the, the developmental aid taken up by the militants are you know, sent to the headquarter of terrorist organization which is used to fund other terrorist bases in other countries. They, they are internationally funding the terrorist organization which is very crazy. Moving on to the first criteria, in terms of humanitarian crisis, which is better. The first contention coming from the, the uh, previous speaker is that poverty is the cause of conflict. Because of the poverty, you know, uh, people are recruited, they join the, these organizations. Uh, first of all, the context of Sahel is, you know, people are living in society with no, no stable job. Like, they are nomad people, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen. They don't understand the actual society of Sahel. They are not, we are not talking about, you know, countries or society in a Western liberal democracy. Second thing is, yes, poverty may be the cause of the problem, but in order to deal with poverty, we need politics or governance to begin with. Without security, with the existence of political instability, how is it possible for the state to effectively allocate resources to provide welfare to the people on the ground? Under their mother, the poverty will be structurally perpetuated because of the dysfunctionality of the state governance, but under our mother, because the military have more capability to crack down these organi terrorist organizations effectively, we can at least ensure the security and safety or stability of politics. politics. Then we can have better governance and we can better allocate resources in order to minimize the economic disparity in these regions. They are misunderstanding the order with which we can solve the problem. But uh, second argument is about the perception, right? The, you know, military aid gives wrong perception that you know Western are funding military. But the question here is already these uh, radicalized groups have strong hatred or hostility against the, uh, against the state to begin with. Yeah. They, their answer of point of view information is it's just a matter of the past, our stream occurring. That's a matter of past. We don't think so. It is kind of hatred is still continuous. That's exactly why still so many organizations are having the expanded membership in the Sahel region. We, they cannot just win the debate by saying it's a matter of past, therefore, you know, uh, perception is uh, it's not unique. But more than that, this perception argument also occurs under their paradigm too. Because the West are giving them development aid to this country, that still gives the impression to this people that you know the development aid are westernized, thereby Western you know, uh, culture uh, some, somewhat disseminated across the regions. Uh, second, moving on to second criteria, sustainability, right? You know, job demand of job for military will increase. That's their arguments, right? Many people want to join military and if military aid is given to military. That's good. We need stronger military. We need more larger military capability. They effectively crack down the expanding terrorist activity in Sadiqa. But second of all, it's a bit contradictory. They say poverty is a cause of, cause of conflict. If people find a job, 
then that can be solved. I mean, I mean, poor people can find a job by you know, joining the military, they can get stable income, they can get stable a life there, therefore the cause of the conflict that they talk about poverty can be somewhat minimized if people have the opportunity to join the military. It's the Asian. Moving on to the final argument. How about, or I will take you tactical. Okay, you said joining military is good for people, but in terms of humanitarian harm, don't you think it is bad for the humanitarian harm? Because, because it's human beings who are like, utilized as soldiers risk their lives. No, no, no. First of all, I think it's a choice if you want to military. If you want to join military, you can join military. The second of all, or collectively we can ensure security with a stronger military capability, which benefit everyone in society. Because yeah. Innocent people can no longer get involved in the accidents or conflict or terrorism. Sorry. To begin with, no thank you. I've already taken you I'm sorry. And my partner, what my partner proven, uh, had proven, had proven in this debate, is this military aid is illegally or like uh, unduly acquired or taken by you know nobody or military to radical groups within South Korea. Right now. The problem here is an international network of terrorist organizations across the world. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have an analogy in Mali or in Algeria. The terrorist organization have connection with Al Qaeda in Saudi Arabia or in Afghanistan or Pakistan. Mr. Speaker, we see the network of terrorist organizations is extremely international, which means that if the, these radical groups acquire money or uh, uh, money from military aid, they can send that money to the headquarter of terrorist organization. The headquarter can use that money to fund other terrorist bases in other countries. These uh, international terrorist organizations can uh, utilize this money to buy stronger guns, stronger weaponry. They are basically funding military international terrorist organizations in a global level, which is extremely strenuous. What we want to, what we can achieve on this side of the house is if we increase the military aid, it, uh, it increases you know, a diplomatic, strong diplomatic relation with the United States and other Western countries. That's, uh, that is because the United States of America have been fighting against war on terror, which means that they have an interest in strong increase in the military capability and cracking down the terrorism sphere. If such region have more capability to effectively crack down military activity, it is, that is extremely desirable for the United States of America, America, which means the United States of America will be further more cooperative with such region or other Middle East Asia or other African countries to further crack down terrorist organizations or terrorist activity. We can create a positive cycle on this side of the house, right? The United States will fund more and this uh, military capability will increase, they can further they crack down the terrorist organization, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen. What we, uh, Tokyo Boys Collection, have proven today is extremely simple. One, the Prime Minister's speech was completely considered, thereby only <laughs> the Deputy Prime Minister's speech is what we uh, responded. Two, it is uniquely in such a region, people, in, conservative, in, in this conservative society, people are normal, thereby means the development aid doesn't function properly within this particular context, unlike other countries, unlike other you know, developing countries. Moreover, military aid is particularly indispensable in order to effectively or more effect efficiently crack down already exacerbated terrorist activity. To that extent, we are happy to vote. Thank you. Now I invite member of government. Keeps on emphasizing the importance of the military. They fail to grasp the 
the crux of today's debate, which is to compare what to prioritize between developmental aid and military aid. The opening government has talked to, talk to you about the military aid and why it should not be given in this context, or it should not be prioritized over development, right? So, in the, ladies and gentlemen, as the closing government, what we're going to talk to you is this. We recognize to a certain extent that development and military are both important in the context, in this kind of yeah, yeah. What, what, what matters is that whether or not we should aid them militarily or aid the development, considering that these two things are somewhat mutually exclusive, which one should we prioritize? That is where we are going to debate, and we are going to bring today's debate, and we are going to win. Ladies and gentlemen, first, start with how this, um, you know, like the military aid and what the consequences are for this region, right? Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard from the opening co uh, opposition about how they keep, like, you know, uh, they're going to crack down on this system of extremism and so on. If it is that simple, ladies and gentlemen, it would have ended, right? But it is not something that works based on the simulation. It is not as simple as you, know, you give military aid, the military becomes stronger, and then they suddenly like, destroy, they purge this earth of those extremists and so on. No, that is not that simple, right? Because you cannot actually that easily, like, you know, find the headquarters of the people, for example. Or as Thomas actually characterized, right? Those people are hiding, they're in hiding, they have guns and so on. You don't know when they're going to strike. You can build up a military for one or two years and they might not strike and then they might strike greatly like you know, suddenly, right? So it's going to be a very prolonged war in a sense that even though no virtual conflict exists, it is still going to prolong the conflict when you are trying to build up your forces with all those military. And while you are doing so, you are also ignoring the developmental aspect of those countries, like of those regions. You are ignoring the fact that a lot of people are starving, are suffering. A lot of people are suffering from collateral damages, for example, or suffering from the lack of focus put on development. What I'm saying here is that it may cause even the creation of more dissidents in the first place, which is going to even further jeopardize the safety or the security of the region that is already greatly compromised by the existence of the extremists, right? So what I'm saying here is that the opening opposition did not to put these things into focus. So what I'm going to do, to do, uh, to do it, uh, you know, here is that going to analyze what if, you know, you put um, you know, your focus on development aid, who is going to patch up the military power and how it is going to be better? Mr. Speaker, yes, the military power is important. What we need to see here is that the West uh, government or the West world does not need to contribute or to focus their aid on the military because they believe that Africa can solve it internally. Look, we have, we have moved past that situation when, you know, like, the Africa cannot co cooperate and so on. We have the African Union in the first place. Now, we believe that it is possible for them to build up military, co uh, collaborative military, and then use that military power that the opening opposition seems to be lacking, but when they are combined, can be strong, and use that military power to combat these issues, when the internal issues of insecurity and so on. We believe that that is an effective method, an effective model that does not need additional aid from the Western world, no thank you, and we believe that it is far more important because there are two main differences, right? There are main differences between governmental aid and military aid. When we talk about military aid, when you give it to those people, right? The, uh, when you give it uh, to this, uh, like, you know, military power, right? You can understand that it might change hands in the first place. You can give them this training, you can give them this military gadgets, um, raiders, and so on, right? But as the opening opposition considered, the, um, the situation is unstable. What if it changes hands? What if the insurgents succeeded in occupying a certain place? Then basically you have just wasted all your time funding what would have been what would have been used for the terrorists or for the extremist groups, basically. Basically, we think that these sort of things, exactly because it is volatile, we believe it is useless to just increase the sheer number of military gadgets, of military power, and so on. We believe that increasing that is not going to help secure the matters more. Because if you succeed in strengthening your military, you still have to wait for prolonged war with extremists. If you fail to do so and they overcome you, then you have just aided them, ladies and gentlemen. So we believe that this characterization of military aid is what is important and the closing government provided to you uniquely that, right? Secondly, what we're going to talk to you about is how this development aid is important, right? They keep talking about how this development aid can be used for the terrorist benefits and so on. We disagree with that. We're saying that the development aid is not something, as the opening government said, it is not like, you know, humanitarian aid, like food and like, uh, uh, clothes and stuff. We're focusing a little bit more about something like, you know, that can be, kept, that can be lasting, that is permanent. We're talking about how those people can benefit from permanent, like the infrastructure, from permanent, I don't know, electric electricity, roads, and so on, something that can increase the overall satisfaction and overall quality of life in the first place. No, thank you. We're saying 
that this development aid is important because it can be deployed in a certain way that the government wants to see fit in order to be lasting. And the, the beauty of development here is that if the development is done, uh, you know, and it, you know, supposedly the country changes hands, wow. then the infrastructure is still there. Then you do not immediately jeopardize the livelihood of the people in the certain period, in this area. I'm going to closing. The problem of the gradual decrease in EG aid can cause a gradually increase in militant attack and damage to the infrastructure which wants to protect which is What we're saying here is that the military power will not decrease if you focus your efforts on the African Union as a whole, Mr. We're not advocating the decrease in military. We're saying that the increase in military does not require military aid from the Western world. And this is where my second, sorry, my third extension is going to be. What is the difference, right? Ladies and gentlemen, development is stagnant. When you talk about, like, you know, um, giving this uh, infrastructure, right? It has only like limited number of developments that it can gain for a certain area. Because if you develop this A area, you are neglecting the development of B area. Therefore, we should maximize the development in order to be able to like, you know, uh, equally distribute the number of equal development aid and development in those areas. It doesn't change. For military, however, we do not need to focus that much aid because the number of personnel can be tackled simply because military is mobile. It can move from one place to another. You do not need to move to, to focus your effort on this country A's military, country B's military, when in fact they can just gather A and B and they can move from one place to another in the case, in the event of insurgent attacks, in the event of those instabilities. What we're saying here is that because the, you know, the nature of the mobile uh, you know, like, uh, military aid, it becomes more and more apparent that the, apparent that development aid is more important because if you decrease the number of your development aid to prioritize military aid, what you are simply giving is to give this military support that the people do not need and may be counterproductive in the event of insurgents occupants of this uh, country. What I'm saying is that if you give you, uh, the, the development aid max, it, you know, in a maximum level and focus on development of several areas, then at least you are securing the livelihood of those people in those areas, which is mutually exclusive with the military because the infrastructure cannot be moved. And what I'm saying is that if you guarantee the livelihood, it will, it will cause less possibility of dissidents from appearing in the future due to dissatisfied people. For all these reasons, for all this contributive analysis, we believe that the closing government has taken its space. Thank you. Next speaker for speech now, I direct the corner for member of opposition. Trying, trying to run AU in the first place. In that case, we think it's impossible for AU to cover every single 
yeah. the experience is occurring there in the first place. And second of all, they distinguish like the development A the, and uh, military A by saying like how military is not necessary because military is more about. We think that mobility and military is totally uh, something as harm in the first place. Why is that? Because we think the important fact, factor of military is not to, uh, not necessarily to like go and like stop the conflict itself, but exist as a, itself to work as a deterrence power. That's extremely necessary. So we think that being immob immobile and staying, in the, for example, around the border is crucially necessary for the military itself. In that case, we think large number of military militants are crucially necessary, and therefore we can say it. the military is, is crucially necessary yeah. in, the, in order to protect the security. So moving yeah. on to the first issue. Issue. So okay, so we already told you like what's going to occur by taking the proposal. But what, which part of the military is capacity faculty faculty is going to be cut by taking the proposal? We think that the first part will be like uh, the security around the borders. Why is that? Because we think that these most of the government is allocated in the central part of these kind of country in the first place. And these the military people who order the military are the one for governmental officials and so forth. And the center of economy is always exists in the center. In that case, we think in order to, in order in the procedure of cutting the military aid, the priority will be to protect the governmental or like or officials or government office or existing in the central part and the, for example the regional part or the the part of the border and these part and part are likely to cut the for example militants that are allocated in these kind of area. And why is this so harmful? Because we think that security in the border is crucial crucial necessary to keep stability. Why is that? Because if the the, the border is not as kept as secure, secure as the status quo, what can happen is that there's going to be a lot of for example refugees coming in from like other parts of region where a lot of refugees are going to go out into the other parts of region. And why is it so harmful? Because the unique nature of these kind of Sahala like area, because there are a lot of ethnicity existing, we think that these kind of confusion or um, a mixing of these ethnicity is crucially damaging towards the stability itself. For example, think, think that about the case of the Congo, the Congo First War, uh, Second War was actually brought about because of the hundreds of refugees coming in from, uh, uh, from the Rwanda and Suchi conflict. And also in the case of the Egypt, when the Egypt, um, American government has actually cut the military aid, what happened is that the a lot of Egyptians run away to uh, uh, run military aid. The a lot of Egyptians were able to run away to Israel, and they received a huge oppression down there. Yeah. We think, therefore, we think that these kind of um, uh, like cutting of aid and cutting the military number in the border can actually cause these kind of instability and also further oppression due to different ethnicity. And second, the second part that they will cut is like we think that the wage cut, like the opening government already set up, is like uh, already have told you, is likely to occur. Why is this so harmful? So the closing the opening government and closing government already talked about how they are put in an economically devastating situation. We think that if these like militants, like wages are cut, or if the militants are going to lose their own jobs, where do they go to? We think that they rather than going to other sorts of corporations which don't exist in this kind of area, we think they'll rather enter, for example, rebels or enter this kind of guerrillas because these guerrillas have a strong incentive to actually attract these people by using the monetary power that is funded from other parts of the, the country and yeah. other parts of the society, of, of the world as well. And therefore, we think there's more likelihood of militants moving into these kind of rebels, which is going to fuel the number of rebels and which is going to damage what the government side is trying to protect. Moreover, we think that these, uh, uh, we, we, we think that, okay, so uh, moving on to the second, moving on, yes. Okay, if only we can have bus capacity accommodation, there's no other way for people to live than to risk their lives. It's a really, really sustainable way to do that. We think it's better than they, 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 they themselves going into these extremist Islamic yeah, extremists yeah. in the first place. So moving on to the second issue. So why uh, why the, the security has to be protected? So the government side is trying to protect how the developmental is crucially necessary for development. But first we told you, we, we think that because of these countries uh, is living in desert, we think that there aren't many resources that actually exist to develop their, themselves. And moreover, we think development aid is not necessarily effective in the first place because a lot of, we see a lot of African countries going into the spiral of debt because of the de de development aid that was given by the Western countries. In that case, we can say that the, the, the effect of this development aid is not necessarily strong as the government side assumes. Moreover, we think that in terms of development, that having lack of military aid is crucially bad. Why is that? Because we think that the, the major reason why like NGO are not incentivized to go to Fordham Sudan, Somalia, is because there's severe insecurity going down there. If the NGO know that military aid is now cut off, there's less incentive for these NGOs to have to go out and help people living down there in the first place. So in terms of development, our side takes this way as well. But even if development is not going to be achieved, because the, the effect of development aid is not necessarily effective as the other side said, we think that having more military aid should be prioritized. Why is that? Because we already told you how these countries have a lot of like sources of religious conflict, a lot of the ethnic division, for example, 
Sudan has been fighting against the, in Sudan. This ethnic conflict has been occurring for 25 years. In that case, we think that like calming down these kind of insecurity is the first thing that we have to put as a top priority. And why is the military aid so much effective? Because firstly, we think that military aid is working as a strong deterrence power. If the rebels know that, for example, that the military aid is actually supported by the West, they're actually scared to attack these kind of military itself because they know that they have the highest, for example, the type, technology type of weapons and so forth. In that case, we think in the aftermath product, what's going to happen is that these like top leaders, for example, rebels, can use the rhetoric to that. They're, for example, uh, to uh, to, uh, to the subordinates that see the military aid is now cut off. There's less than like, military power going down there. There it is now the time to attack the military, attack the government, and even in the worst case scenario, overturn of government might happen. From all these reasons, we what well, we have told you today. We told you how first we saw the deadlock between the opening half by providing you the analysis of the importance of the uh, military. Second of all, we told you how we're giving you the clearly realistic analysis about what's going to occur in the Afghan product. So from all these reasons, we're extremely proud of those. Thank you. I thank the speaker for the speech. Now, I would like to call upon the government work. analyze and how actually our paradigm will be successful in the realistic manner by analyzing the lots of actors, especially in South Africa, and we, can t we already told you how our paradigm will cre uniquely create the better situation, especially for the Sahel region. And so, that's the unique and biggest contribution coming from the closing government, and we think it's enough reason to win throughout this debate, but the government whip, as a government whip, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to analyze two issues as my role. Firstly, I can examine the cause of conflict. It is extremely static analysis coming from the opening of and uh, opening of opposition and closing of opposition. There's no reason why finally came from both two sides as to why the incentive or the intensity of the intensity of the will never changes because of the external actor. But we substantiated how actually we can mitigate those kind of grievance or the, the intensity of the will by changing external factor. No. So, and secondly, and how this policy, or the, which part, which part that will create the better, con better conditions, better consequences for the African nations, and my partner's extension is highlight how actually our program will realistically achieve the constructive and better consequences for the African nations. Before that, engagement to what the Pilar Khan mentioned. So, firstly, and the Pilar somehow told you that the existence of debt crisis, that's why development is ineffective, etc. etc. Ladies and gentlemen, but well, we can still say our paradigm is better because we can mitigate the impact of debt which is, uh, which is accumulated inside the African nations. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we have to recognize even in the case of military aid, those aid will be accumulated in the first place. So, ladies and gentlemen, to, to, to the issue of the debt crisis, we can create the better approaches for the African nations by actually increasing the power of the development and lessen the amount of the, lessen the amount of debate, not thank you, and creating the room for the African nations to develop themselves. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, basically, and if you want to take about the case of the debt, the outside is completely better. Second, no, and the existence of NGO loses its incentive to help the, uh, the African nation, which is quite fantastic analysis. Precisely because, ladies and gentlemen, the fundamental aim of the NGO to actually help the development, and as long as uh, as long as those kind of goals well, isn't to be fulfilled, what's the incentive? What's the disincentive for the NGO to actually stop its support? Although the amount of the aid, the amount of the development aid, is compatibly uh -huh. increased. Well, yeah. oh, thank you, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. The NGO doesn't work just because of the, those, those kind of comparative reasons. But NGO moved based on its creed or based on its belief to actually help the development inside African uh -huh. regions. So as long as those kind of goals isn't fulfilled.
fulfilled, there's so huge incentive for NPO, NGO to continue supporting. And they will take you later, not thank you. So lastly, the, those kind of red flag, using the red flag, or actually the instigated conflict, etc, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, those kind of claim is based on the capability of the terrorist group to attack those kind of regions. But ladies and gentlemen, my partner Steven Sir has already analyzed how actually to create an flexible and mobile military action and successfully prevent those situations Stop. from happening. No. So ladies and gentlemen, as long as the closing document is substantiated, how actually even the current situation in the military across the Africa is actually capable to deal with the conflict in South Africa regions, those that they claim it isn't so strong in the first place. Before we know, okay. Yeah. We told you very clearly the uniqueness of the people of Sahel. How is building a road for nomads in the desert going to achieve development for Algeria? Ladies and gentlemen, the base fundamental assumption coming from the Thomas is it's impossible. But ladies and gentlemen, no thank you. Even this, the, those kind of the forestation in the desert is already happening by using the technology, etc. etc. And even if it's a desert place, we can set rules and actually create a simple the construction place is completely feasible strategy for the Algerian person to, to uh, set up their own businesses. So ladies and gentlemen, we think that as long as there's a money and there's a place, there's a cheap labor, no thank you, there's a so huge possibility of the development. There. So, Stop. let me go to the first issue, not back to the cause of the conflict. The extremely static analysis coming from the opening opposition is the terrorist moved on its own dogma. Sir. It's it kind of irrational argument, not that true. So it's impossible to change its their own interest. And the closing opposition said, in the case of the Egypt or the Israel, because of those ethnic conflicts, it's extremely difficult to create the constructive approach between them. Ladies and gentlemen, basically we say, yes, they are kind of dogmatic, but it doesn't mean that will is automatically strong in the first place. Ladies and gentlemen, those kind of intensity of the will is strongly defined through the external condition in the first place. Those destabilization of the fundamental uh, basis of the life, no thank you, accumulated the grievance, and actually it badly incentive individual to join the government, join in the bad way. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, those ethnic conflicts or the religious conflicts specifically happen in the conflict place or the situation, the fundamental basis of the lifestyle is basically unstable. That's why ladies and gentlemen, although religious or the ethnic conflict even there uh, certainly exists in a developed country, but because of the lives, uh, those kind of well-being of the citizens on the ground is completely ah. secured, no thank you, those kind of the intensity of the world is relatively, uh, relatively less. That's why ladies and gentlemen, we think the development which directly contributes to the stabilization of the, uh, the well-being of the individual, uh, stabilization of the well-being of the individual is particularly necessary to disincentivize the people to join or actually uh, exercise not thank you those violent action. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, we say that basically development, uh, development aid is the only way to create a constructive, constructive approach and put the end on the endless conflict which uniquely happens in the opposition's paradigm. So, that's why, ladies and gentlemen, my partner's analysis is so important because we can clarify how actually conflict happens, the incentive changes. Second, second thing about the efficacy of this proposal. Ladies and gentlemen, closing government is the only actor who provided a comparative and realistic analysis as to how we can create the constructive and better consequences for the African regions, precisely because, ladies and gentlemen, we provide you number one, those kind of, uh, they still immediately is existing across the region, because, ladies and gentlemen, we are only, only talking about a case of aid, not vanishing immediately in the first place. And secondly, my partner, Stevens, has already told you there's other actors existing as supplementary process, like the case of EU, like the case of US peacekeeping forces, or even in worst cases, the UK or the French government actually intervening into those regions and works as a supplementary process to actually secure the entire region. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter somehow tried to somehow try to tell you and those kind of that uh, it's incapable because there's a huge conflict. One, it's overestimation, and two, in the case of small insurgent, that we can do it, we can do with that by its own mentally. Three, if it's a big case of insurgent, we can combine and tackle those kind of big issues. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, the real side of the government specifically proved to you how mentally aid, uh, the curtailing mentally aid, and increasing development aid is the only way to create the constructive and better consequences for African nations we propose. <laughs> Madam Speaker, our speech. Now I direct the call upon opposition whip.
Ladies and gentlemen, as Peter specifically talked to you, this debate is about comparison. We also have the benefit because they want to protect the economic benefit or development benefit to some extent. But we also have to secure security for every individual, so which is the top priority, Mr. Speaker. We say, the side of the house haven't fulfilled their burdens because they haven't shown why, even though those, people, those countries to some extent sacrifice their own safety, security, they can also prioritize those economic benefits. We talk to you, those countries mustn't prioritize economic benefit in the first place. What we have to do here is guarantee the security, especially. Especially in the context where religious value or those kind of things is so important, even though some economic benefit, economic development, or westernized development can occur on the side of the house. We say it's rather better on the side of the house to guarantee the security for these people where those people can easily subscribe to their own religion. We think if that kind of safety was guaranteed, their policy just jeopardize those people's ability, no thank you, to fulfill their own liberty or life self actualization by creating westernized development. We think it's totally disgrace. I'm going to talk about two things in my speech. Firstly, which can protect the peace in the first place, specifically counting opposition, analyze the unique context of this motion, because this motion is not about totally ban. What happens if we start to take this policy and how it's damaging to the people? Secondly, which is better, no thank you, even though they want to say they become development and so forth, which is better for the people themselves to have first hand right, like to life, like to sanity, or that kind of thing, which can be guaranteed red cross, which was rushed because of Somalia's strong, uh, devastating situation, which Nagasan totally neglected. So, first case, which can protect the peace? What we have from the opening government was metal weapons are spreading out, it is damaging because of the existence of the black market. So, Mr. Speaker, of course we have to some extent check and system. We can hear how important it is in the first place. After this problem, even if that is the case, that already exists or still exists on their problem, we can hear any difference in the first place. But moreover, perhaps Pakistan or Saudi Arabia or those governments have an incentive to fund for those terrorist groups. In some occasions, if that is the case, we don't think the price of that kind of thing is so important on their problem. Still, they can purchase those products and use it to crack down the government itself. No sense. Thank you. Then they said, so the power effect is e effective. Say that school people suffering from the poverty and also feeling antipathy, so they get into the mid, uh, not mid, areas, and after taking this policy, it suddenly changes. So, Mr. Speaker, we couldn't hear any example to the, of the terrorist groups which moves by soft power. No, thank you. No terrorist group moves by soft power, like say, so emotional security or your generalist, or that kind of stuff. We think totally ridiculous. They are moved by religious value. They are moved by inherent and historical ethnic divide. In those cases, no, thank you. Their policy won't change anything at all. We say it's better than harmful, because those people will lose their way to make uh, employment, to lose their way to earn money. As a result, we think those people, especially for masculine, allows killing others can rather move to the guerrillas. No thank you, it's rather counterproductive. What we found from the closing government is quite shallow analysis. Alternative exists. AU succeeded without any support. No, factory too, we could have told you they of course they get supporting, not thank you. But as I told you, ECOWAS is mainly moved by Nigeria. In those cases, other countries don't have any capacity to do it in the first place. As a result, although lots of countries are suffering, it is impossible for the or Nigeria itself, only Nigeria, to control any other countries. But moreover, we talk to you, it is important to have individual military inside your country always. Because if you can always power in that country, it can deter lots of lots of militants. Lots Thank you, easily put out. Then the government would somehow say, because those people are so specific, we can easily take it uh, open. So, which is firstly contradictory with the member of the government, which says most of the militants are in a hidden situation. We think to deter those people, no, thank you, we have to have strong deterrence power. So, what we talk to you from closing opposition, all merely talked about uh, it is unsafe because we can decrease the military aid, but we specifically talk to you what happens if we take this policy. First place, no, thank you, borders have to be cut. Because state makes comparison between cities and rural areas, and it is easier for the government to cut the rural areas up, areas because they won't get 
less criticism from the city's people. The important point here is refugees can directly increase and go in and go out, just the same case as Asia, where US military aid was cut. People talk to you, no engagement from the asylum house, no sanction. And we talk to you, especially ethnicity, or religious divide, Tutsi and Hutu, those things are so inherent and so. And if one ethnicity group comes into your country and damages your welfare, damages your budget, damages or start to you breathe in your environment, the antipathy towards these people directly increases no sanctions and more oppression from car, we think it's rather counterproductive. Second step that we talked to you was no thank you wage cut. Because of those kind of things, people firstly have to suffer from daily life as they concede it. But moreover, those people can be moved easily by the rhetoric of the Islamic militants, which says government is not generous, you can come into ourselves, let's crack down that government. Those incentives or those rhetoric can work well on our side of the house. More employment, more empowerment for these militants can occur. Before I move into the impact opening. Okay, even if it's true as the opposition says, this Germany is not going to affect the borders and desert, but this is those aid are still going to affect the city area and can't have the people's shops and major aid that destroy them. Sorry, uh, I couldn't understand your POI. Okay. So, we talk about <laughs> the important part here is more breaking of infrastructure because it is easier for the militants to crack down the government, or incentive to crack down the government can be much, much higher, which is not dealt with their side of the house. We say more break on militants for these cities, or more break on militants towards the government can directly occur, which is totally counterproductive, even though you want to increase development aid because it can be rather damaged, it can be nothing but just dead remains. Second case, which is better for the people? All this said, people won't go to those military because they understand they don't have to. But Mr. Speaker, no, because those people have to suffer from the incessant threat from the militant attack. In those cases, they need some protection. To achieve that protection, they have to go into the military, but if the military's wages is decreasing, they can easily go into the guerrillas. We think it's totally bad. But then they said, infrastructure can be created. But how it can be sustainable? We didn't hear any analysis. As I told you, rather it can be counterproductive to create more and more deaths without this Nasty. We say it's totally damaging. So when we talk to you from closing opposition, we talk to you three things. First, even if the status quo we to some extent have some cultural, agriculture, or such kind of industry, but two, we talk to you NGO Red Cross incentive to go with dietary decreases, that's the same case in Samaria, because your officers have to be threatened with life. But lastly, even if that is the case, like development can be to some extent hindered, we think it's fine, because we rather have the security, we can subscribe to the top, we can fulfill our self-factorization. We talk to you, Mr. Speaker, we talk to you, we can protect peace by specifically analyzing the importance of this debate, but we talk to you, people can be more satisfied on the side of the house. That's the reason why the opposition proceeds to grand final.